welcome to Explore, Explain. This is a long-form video and podcast series sharing conversations with data visualisation designers and developers from around the world. Each episode explores the detailed hidden thinking behind a single project or a series of related works to explain the what, the why and the how of the design process. There are some wonderful guests and some wonderful projects to learn about. So let's jump in to today's episode with your host, Andy Kirk. Hello and welcome to another episode of Explore Explain. It's a very exciting special episode. We've got two guests. I'm delighted to welcome Jen Christensen and Moritz Stefaner. Jen, Mo, great to see you again. Can I ask you to introduce yourselves, who you are, where you work, what you do, starting perhaps with Jen. Sure. Hi. Thanks so much for having us. Um, I'm Jen Christensen. I'm a graphics editor at Scientific American Magazine, which is based in New York City, but I am currently working from home in uh, New Haven, Connecticut. Yeah. Hi, I'm Moritz. Uh, thanks, Andy, for the invite. I've always been working from home, so <laughs> to me, things are not that different. I'm an independent expert for data visualization, uh, so... I do all kinds of projects for different clients from large organizations or work a lot with scientists or companies and, and help them find truth and beauty in data, which is my tagline. The truth and beauty operator. Absolutely. Yes. Well, it's great to have you both on this uh, episode. Thank you for your time. We're going to look at one of your projects um, that was produced and published in September of this year, entitled The Language of Science how you've seen the evolution of language in Scientific American over 175 years. This is not a small project. Um, for the benefit, especially of people listening rather than watching, who can't see the project right now, Jen, could you just perhaps introduce the project itself, what it, what it kind of covers and what different assets that you made from this work? Sure, um, so it's a data visualization package. Um, that explores, as you mentioned, the words used in Scientific American over time. Um, it includes 5,107 issues of the magazine, the words that comprise those issues, um, which brings us up to the 175th anniversary issue, which is our September issue. Um, ultimately, that translated into an eight-page print feature, um, a process description sidebar, chart sidebars for the six other feature articles in that print issue, web formatted versions of all of those static print items and an interactive portal for custom word searches. Um, so that kind of the editorial vision uh, is that words used in the magazine over time would provide a glimpse at how science and how we write about it has mm. evolved over the last 175 years. So obviously you know that the 175 year anniversary is looming at various points over the recent time. Um, what made you focus on, on the use of language and perhaps in comparison to the subjects that have been covered over the period, the, the different breakthroughs, the most famous moments? What was the specific angle of language that you felt was most, most worthy of celebrating this, you know, this huge moment in time? Yeah, well, it started a little more open-ended. Um, uh, the... Scientific American Archive Digitization, digitization Project um, was completed about nine years ago. So I knew we had every print issue in digital form, varying digital forms, but in digital form um, at that time, and kind of started toying with the idea of doing something with it for the 170th anniversary. Um, at that time, I was seeing things like um, Popular Science had a few pieces, one by Pitch Interactive and another by um, the Office for Creative Research that were, I believe, edited by Katie Peak. Um, so they had some kind of archive uh, searching portals that would allow you to go back into different mm -hmm. issues um, um, and that sort of thing. But you know, at the time, our resources weren't kind of lined up to really be able to really kind of dive into it properly. So it kind of set it aside until the 175th. Um, at the beginning of the 175th anniversary, uh, I was a little bit more interested in doing some things with the visuals. So Nicholas um, Rougeau uh, did a cover color analysis for us for the January issue, where he looked at kind of the color that made up the different mm. covers and, and, and created a, a portal that folks could go to the initial, um, each issue in the archive from there. So we knew we'd print the, the, the kind of this larger piece 
needed to focus on something other than imagery. Um, mm. And so words were kind of the, the next step. Of course. And, you know, as a magazine, it's, it's not just the topics that you covered. It's kind of how you've written about them and the language and making this magazine accessible to the general population as well as scientists. Um, now, again, back to you, Jen, just to give a bit of context in terms of how you then look for people like this guy to assist you with developing these visuals. How, how do you go about the kind of commissioning process or the, uh, the inv invitation to pitch from freelancers, studios around the world? Sure. So this one, um, uh, well, I'd worked with Moritz uh, in 2013 on a Wild B page for her graphic science page. I really enjoyed that process. Um, Moritz was quite collaborative, but also very self-sufficient and kind of efficient um, and kind of a, a really kind of fun sense of curiosity and a really explored kind of all aspects of the project. So based on that, and then um, hearing him give talks at different conferences over time, kind of get a sense for um, his approach and philosophy and uh, kind of the delight he mm. takes in these kind of topics, <laughs> which, um, which I knew I needed somebody who would be really kind of put a lot of energy and get every, other people excited about it too. Cause it was gonna be kind of a big, a, you know, a long-term project for us. A lot of our projects only last a few months and this one was gonna be longer. Um, and, and mostly I knew that uh, he was very comfortable with deep dives, kind of large projects that are fairly open-ended with really kind of huge kind of overwhelming uh, data sets and to sort of help provide some structure and ways of thinking about that. So, um, yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's decent uh, credential building, uh, Moritz. So from your point of view, the, you know, the, the brief that came to you, uh, what did that look like? And why were you excited about working on this? Mm -hmm. It was pretty open. I think uh, Jen is great in having like a really clear general idea, but not being so like detailed about the specifics that I feel like, well, there's no more fun left, right? And so <laughs> I think that the basic framework was set out really well in terms of this is big picture, what we want to achieve, you know, but there was still yeah, a lot to figure out together, like in terms of how do we approach it? Do we break it up into a lot of little stories? Do we make one big story? This was all still left open to figure out together. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, Jen, you're right. It, it was uh, sort of challenging to also work with this huge amount of data and not even knowing what's in there and what the quality of it is and what could be done with that. Uh, and in the beginning, we had like all kinds of crazy ideas of interesting questions we could ask the data. But then when I started working with it, really, it became clear, okay, some things just won't work the way you might think, and right. you have to work around that and zoom out a bit more out of the data set, go yearly, maybe instead of additions, you know, and make all these smart, very basic data choices as well to, to make a good design piece in the end. And yeah, I enjoy these types of processes where there's a very open question or an open challenge in the data set, and I need to somehow match the two and, and find yeah. an elegant way, you know, on all levels. And I suppose from your point of view, it's helpful to have that openness to give you the canvas to play and explore. Um, right. But you also need to know that the the client, in this case, Jen, is also there to, to give guidance and to commit mm -hmm. and to make judgment calls when you need them. Otherwise, you're in this inertia of just too much opportunity, too much you know space to choose from. Um, and I think it's interesting you mentioned there the the fact that some of the inquiries that you could have pursued and maybe did to a degree in some ways were, were blocked off, not because they were not interesting things to pursue, but actually there were technical obstacles or data obstacles. Um, and I, I think it's it's worth just sort of touching on at this point, the the sort of data set that you worked with and the kind of <laughs> the size and the extent of this. Can you just speak to the, the PDFs yeah. that you received? <laughs> Yeah, the process alone, how they arrived, was funny already. <laughs> Jen, do you want to like trace all the steps this data set had sure. to take to get to me? <laughs> sure. Well, I mean, the digitization project was finished nine years ago, but then of course yeah. it kind of sat there for a while until figuring out, okay, well, we now now we know where it's going to live. We need to get this information to the data viz artist, Moritz. So um, we. Uh, I, I asked the the web dev, dev team, um, you know, can you can you pass this along? And uh, you know, it was just way too large. And so you know, on the day of like our, I think it was our our holiday party, I'm running out to get a hard drive um, from the office to bring back before people left for the holiday party, so they could start the download. 
so that it could download overnight or a couple of days before uh, uh, one of our colleagues who is headquartered in Germany was gonna be returning to Germany. And so that he would, he would carry the hard drive with him so we could just kind of streamline getting it across the pond um, and, then, and then send it um, from there. Uh, but it was a little bit about, uh, yeah, right. So it was a long period. In the movie, this kind of... would be this montage of cutscenes, you know, pet passing yeah. the path. Racing after airplanes that are leaving. And, yeah, <laughs> really. it feels like yeah. a spin off project in yeah. itself, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, we'll get into the weeds of the data in a, in a short while, but just thinking more about the, again, the, the sort of people involved. Um, no, Mo, I, I know that you didn't work necessarily alone entirely on this project. Can you just speak to the other kind of collaborators that you sort of brought in from your side? Sure. Yeah. So I did the the initial like concept explorations and also the, all the the natural language processing myself, which I'm very proud of, <laughs> um, and figured out the basic concept together with Jen and the design approach. But then also brought in my long term collaborator Christian Besser, who was really a brilliant designer and who helped me a lot both with the coding of the interactive application, but also the of the print details um, and uh, the preparation of the print graphics and so on. So it's, at some point, I think in May and we launched in July, August, uh, he was like as involved as I was. Right. Um, and, and from your side, Jen, obviously you can speak on behalf of Scientific American to Moritz if he's, if he's got any domain questions about this, this data set and this topic, but did you also need to bring in other stakeholders, experts, historians to, to add any more perspectives about you know what the what the findings or the discoveries that were emerging whether they are legitimate where what's the, the reasoning for why certain words spike at different times did you need to sort of add other people on your side yeah for sure I mean we had our internal crew uh, Amanda Martinez and Ryan Reed in particular helped a lot with feedback on um, the interactive piece in particular, they both focus on the web, and then our usual crew of fact check, uh, you know, et, et, et cetera. I'm going to forget names if I try to name them all. But um, in particular, at, as you know, from ex outside expert, it, you know, as the project progressed, and we started kind of pinned, they narrowed down exactly what the scope would be, it became clear that um, we needed an introductory essay that would mm -hmm. kind of pull us out of that navel gazing mode, you know, because we were getting really excited about the words we were seeing. But this would only really be intrinsically exciting, I think, to Scientific American super fans or linguists. Mm. <laughs> so, but we needed to figure like, right, this, this needs to appeal to people that aren't necessarily long-term subscribers. Um, and that's when it became clear that a science historian, as opposed to an inside staffer, um, would be the best person to kind of um, write an introductory essay to provide some context. Um, so I provide, I, I proposed um, Maureen Daston to the editorial team. Um, and then also text editor Jen Schwartz was brought in at that time. She's on staff to kind of help create the framing. Um, but Daston felt like a good batch in particular um, because of her book, Objectivity that she co-wrote with um, uh, Peter Gallison. And she kind of identifies these three virtue driven eras of modern science, um, at least in, in Western modern science. Um, and that would be like truth to nature, mechanical objectivity, trained judgments, and kind of the emerging trend of making and seeing. So those kinds of ideas um, would kind of help us keep from leaning too heavily on nouns. And yeah, uh, and, yeah and ob like, you know, you'd expect to see like neuroscience appear later on and anything with quantum and, mm. and yeah, engines would be earlier. But um, that combined with, you know, Moritz already has, was developing this idea of, of looking at different tenses, not just nouns and focusing kind of more broadly. I'll probably speak to that later. But um, Dastin would kind of provide the introductory essay in that same spirit, I think, yeah. to help provide context as what, what we can glean from words. And you, you just touched on there about the kind of readership. I'm just kind of curious about what, to what extent do you have to consciously think about the reads? And maybe this is one for, for Mo as well. The, obviously the, the subscribers are established and there's a sense that you'll, you'll have an, an awareness that they are, I don't know, scientific minded, they are numerate, they are literate, they are interested in complicated subject matter. But does this also have to speak to a wider audience because it is a celebratory piece and it will be accessible to non subscribers as well? Does that, you know, I'll turn to more for this. Does that, does that impact your think, thinking, especially in the design 
or does it more manifest itself more in these essays as a as a hope to draw people in? Yeah, I, I think both. And it's always important to think about, okay, who will in the end like consume these pieces and what are they hoping to get out of it? Mm. Or what, what could they learn from it? And I think knowing a bit what prior knowledge people have can help like pave the path, you know, for interesting insights, not just ones that people know already or that might overwhelm them. And I think in our case, maybe the print piece is more for the long-term readers who already know a bit the history of the magazine and the ins and outs mm. and who are also who really want to spend maybe 10 minutes in figuring out a complex graphic and like going into all the little annotations and uh, for the wider audience we had the online piece which is uh, much more focused much more lean mobile friendly and where you can just scroll through basically and see the top word trends but also type in words and i think a lot of people did that just to see um, I don't know if if data has peaked in, you know, when data has peaked or happiness yeah. or whatever they had on their mind in that moment. And I think that's something that's immediately relatable and invites mm. to playful exploration. And that works for everybody. I think, mm. you know, just giving people a search box and a little line chart, you know, that, that works immediately even at, or regardless how much you know about scientific American. So in a sense that operates both on the level of uh, a kind of a gateway into the subjects, you know, those initial curiosities that people have in almost in a, in a passing by sense, which yeah. might lead them to go to the print and the deeper dive. But, but also, as you said, that that sense that the, the print version is for people who have got that motivation to spend time to maybe even the, the conditions to spend time going for every little corner, every little comment, because that is, they're already in the mode of doing that if they're reading magazines. So it's not a big departure yeah. in terms of the rhythm of the, of the process. Um, now, from your point of view, again, Mo, the, the, the deliverables, Jen spoke to the fact that there's a lot of different assets that spin out of this. Do you, as a designer, have to anchor yourself primarily around thinking about how something may work as a solution for print, for example, and then the other mm. spin out um, deliverables become the, the sort of secondary concerns about how we then make it fit to those or do you just have to simultaneously think about every single different platform this will have to work on yeah 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 I think that was part of the the early brief already that we would have a whole system of, of graphics that we could use for a long coherent print piece however it may look to put into individual articles I think that was a really smart idea that like little charts would go into the whole magazine, like mm. even a few pages on and illustrate like trends relevant to that article. And then we would have the online piece. And so knowing that already I knew, okay, I have to design a system that works in a couple of settings and like both from the code situation, but also from the design that something like the color scale would be used throughout all the graphics. So we have the sense of coherence. And if it's once learned, you know, people can apply that knowledge and when encountering the next graphic and knowing that is super important because often people like brief you just for one graphic and then the project grows and grows yeah. and then you realize ah oh, we should have made like a proper system or have thought about the whole space beforehand right and just knowing okay there will be all these individual products we should plan for that type of thing um that that's always helpful and the, and i think these are the most or, or it's just so nice if uh, there's not just one chart you produce and then you're done, but you actually develop a language that mm. could be developed further, can be used in a couple of contexts. That's, I always enjoy that. That's right. And I think you're right there about the, because obviously one of the formats there and one of you may hold up one of the, ex, uh, the printed examples, but oh yeah, a multi-page sure. multi version. Yeah. And, and sorry, this won't so work for listeners the right opener, now. Basically. But yeah. we'll, um, we'll share this on the video at least. Now, sure. you know, when you've got multiple pages, you kind of need to establish and maintain the consistency of the color palette. When you've got the interactive, which is a very long project, if you kind of printed the whole thing out, you need to kind of bind the color le legend. So you've always got that to refer to. So yeah, these are, these are important aspects of the, of the thought process about what will work across all these, across these platforms. Um, right. Just a quick question for you, Jen, as the kind of custodian of the work, I guess. Um, were there any, I'm trying to think of the right language for this, uh, ironically, but were there any kind of ethical, cultural, political sensitivities that you had to kind of keep in mind, given it's about language, 
that you felt that you just needed to be sort of sensitive to or aware of the prospects of things not not being in you know in accordance with the standards of, of scientific american on that front yeah so um as one of the articles in the issue kind of dives into um uh, scientific american's past is like many publications that are as old as it is are uh, is is sprinkled with uh, some content that uh you know in today's day and age in particular when we look back on it kind of makes us cringe so there's an article called i'm reckoning with our mistakes that was written by jen schwartz and Dan Schlenoff. um and so you know, in the full issue, we were already kind of addressing that there are some topics in the past um, that we can't just sweep under the rug, but we don't want to celebrate. You know, mm. we need to acknowledge, but not um, perpetuate. So, uh, but when you're dealing with a word in an archive, um, you don't want to necessarily strip out words mm. that make people feel uncomfortable now because they are part of that archive, but we didn't want to celebrate them or highlight them. Um, as it turns out, a lot of words that I was kind of a little bit concerned about weren't in the top you know, frequency, which, you know, few, at least that was just a short period in the magazine. I, I just want to say we didn't but, cut anything like manually yeah. from yes. the visualization, like yeah. except for obvious wrong spellings that came from optical character recognition, right. but there was like no, let's say, political editorial um, choices. Yeah, yeah yes. editorial uh, choices. Right. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Yeah. But then um, in the interactive, I mean, we did ask Moritz to search the the full portal for some of the custom word juxtapositions, which I'm, I imagine we'll talk about later. Um, and, but just from the size of just the basic scale issue, the interactive portal has a limit. It was over 4,000 words, but that limit was done um, just based on frequency, yes. not editorially. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, so we, we looked into some of the more kind of problematic words as possible juxtapositions, but um, you know, I think it's really dangerous to kind of show visually small pieces that people can kind of share easily out mm. of context. You know, that's where mm. like this, this article itself, it talks about the nuance of language and the context and, and um, it, it provides a lot more information around that. And it kind of forces the reader to really kind of engage with a thought process. Yes. Where if we just kind of highlighted a few single words, um, people might say, oh, that word was important at that time. Yeah. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. well, no, it was being used in a way that it shouldn't have been used at that time. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, like we didn't want people to be able to just kind of jump to conclusions or take screenshots or, um, or yeah. share things. So even though there were words that weren't used very frequently, and um, we didn't want to add and put, you know, give them additional prominence. And I suppose that's a, one of the challenges around, again, thinking about the assets, you know, there will be inevitably bite-sized snippets worthy of social media sharing. And of course, you want to make sure that they aren't missing the context or nuance that would come with the accompanying article, I guess. Um, from a design point of view, Jen, do you have to impose on people like Moritz uh, design restrictions type face choices, color restrictions, or is it usually a fairly blank canvas on that front? Uh, well, we definitely have, uh, you know, font styles uh, and sizes to adhere to and, you know, just the the dimensions of the page dealing with gutter spaces, right. that sort of thing. We were a little bit more flexible with font size on this one. <laughs> a, few, a few of our fonts were a little smaller. We had uh, to. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> There's the added wrinkle of our print fonts family is different than our web font family. So there needed to be two outputs for that. Um, but because most of this was built out of small multiples, we could um, build out pages pretty easily in terms of the just setting the geometry and being able to accommodate gutters right. and um, margins um, without too much trouble. Right. But of course, these are things you need to know how kind of up front before you start to get all experimental with all these different devices. Um, Moritz, I know that you're, you are a, a keen conceptualizer. I know that you very much should, early into your process, you are coming up with ideas and concepting. What did they look like before you kind of got into the, the, the data and the actual process itself? What, what sketches were you putting down? What kind of, um, what kind of ideas come to mind? And also to that point, and this is maybe one for Jen to follow up on, were there any other pieces that you sort of refer to and were inspired by or wanted to avoid doing from the point of view of, you know, plagiarism or duplication? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, at the beginning, there was so much possible in principle, because if you just say, well, here's 175 years of science reporting, you know, go crazy. It's, it's, it's a lot of possibilities now what you can do with this. And one thing is looking at, okay, what's the actual text content I could work with? So I had the PDFs and the, there was optical character recognition done on the original pre-digital PDFs, which was of course the bulk of it. Mm. And it works pretty well, but the problem is if you have, for instance, a lot of columns, the optical character recognition might not recognize that the column goes like this and then the text starts back up, right. but it goes horizontal. And when I saw that, I was like, okay, it's gonna be difficult to do anything with like whole sentences or even phrases because there could be like just arbitrary, you know, combinations of words. And um, yeah, and, and lots of like misspellings or lots of like little character flips N and H are really hard to distinguish or I and J, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's for machine, it's hard to, to read arbitrary fonts from 150 years ago. And so th that was important to understand, okay, what's the actual raw material we can work with. And then the other thing I had to find out is like, who's actually, what is the subject of, of our visualization? So we could say, we talk about individual editions mm -hmm. of the magazine and characterize them through words or, or trends, right? And then we could talk about maybe what are similar editions or what were similar years or something like this. And then those would be the subject and we use the words as their attributes or properties. Or we could say, we talk about the words and how they have developed in the, under the eyes of Scientific American, right? And that sort of flips this whole mm. perspective. And we, yeah, we could have talked about, again, time and use just the number of editions and the topics as something that characterizes a whole decade or something. So for me, the one of the key questions at the beginning is really who are we actually talking about? Like, or what's the main subject of our visualization? And what are the things then we could measure about them? And I looked a lot actually into if there were any big breaks in the history, like if the text contents had changed a lot suddenly, right? Mm. And so I was thinking about, okay, maybe we can define different eras in the magazine's history just based on the text. And I, th I think we can, and uh, based on other like structural like properties, like how, how, how much text was published. Yeah, um, sort of scale of, scale of the, the mass. Exactly, of yeah. yeah, or how much text versus images. Yeah. I was also looking into interpunctuation, like how many commas, how many exclamation marks, how many question marks, right? And emojis, um, yeah. <laughs> emoji, yeah, pre-emoji, but I, even like question mark versus exclamation mark had like an interesting like scissor type trend. Okay. And so there's so much you can pull like from text and, and I, I explored a lot there at the beginning, but then like when it, so we did this first exploration just to figure out, okay, can we do a, a cool project? That's the first thing we wanted to figure out in like even half a year before the actual project started. And once we knew, you know, like the data siding was there and it seemed like, okay, this is cool. And then we said like we, the project actually had a, a break and then we said, mm. okay, now what do we actually do, right? And looking at all these explorations again and also playing more with like word types, like what, are, what were the top adjectives and how I have, you know, how have verbs shifted and so on. I, I, I became more and more convinced that actually looking at the individual trends of words, like how the popularity of a word in the magazine has shifted, that this is gonna be the, the key mm. vehicle for everything because that would be able to do everything and it's always gonna be interesting and, and simple and neat. And um, I built one like prototype where you could scroll through time. So you could basically say, let's go to 1850 and show me all the words that peaked in their usage mm -hmm. in 1850 and had like 12 words and then 1860 and there was a slider and you could just go back and forth and back and forth and the little peaks were shifting back and forth and around that there was lots of like little mountain <laughs> movements i was like yeah that's cool that's it you know sometimes you see something and you're like yeah that's a good like basic mechanism like right. all these little words and they all have their peak you know each each word has has their peak it's all very like also on the same like level you know it's just yeah the times are changing and word usage is changing uh, if you would just show what, conversely, what were the top words in the <clears throat> 1890s? What were the top words in the 1880s? It's going to be very dull because mm. the top words are often the same. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> flipping this perspective and just saying like, okay, word, what was your history? Right? Yes. That, that was sort of the key design decision. And after that, it was more, okay, how do we now assemble the pieces? Right? Mm. And how do we combine them? And 
How do we sequence things? What do we annotate? And, um, I think one of the early touchstones too was, and, and one of the things that I was showing to my colleagues while you were exploring, but before there were things that to kind of share with the larger team mm -hmm. to get the buy-in was the, um, the whole brilliant enterprise, uh, which was done by Office for Creative Research, again, for Katie Peake and PopSci, right. which was 50 years of NASA annual reports. And that they were, they were looking at, like, I think um, that word frequency, but also like first occurrence words is kind of what we were started to thinking about, but mm -hmm. that became um, because of the, the OCR um, limitations that, that Maureen explained first occurrence we couldn't definitively say mm, but that yeah. was kind of like early on like kind of the editorial team was thinking that might be interesting but uh um, yeah. where it's just explorations kind of push beyond that. so uh, it sounds That's like another thing i realized but... it's really you will you want to look for names or you know places and so on mm. but searching for proper nouns or proper names is super hard because they need to be multi-word construction so mm. new york now is new an adjective or is it part of new york you know and how is it different from York? And you know, and it's these things become super complicated. And that's it's another thing I realized playing with the data early. This would be something everybody's interested in, but we can't really work reliably with names and place names and everything else. So yeah. It's another thing like in a in a perfect world, you know, where we could spend another year with a brilliant like computer scientist and language expert, then you know, we could do all this topic modeling and whatnot, but just yeah, in this sort of framework, it, it was also clear, okay, this is not something that can work even. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's good to know early on. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. Not, not, you know. <laughs> and I think we should put this on ice for the 200th anniversary, maybe that's a one to revisit. Ah, there we go. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so it sounds like in, in a sense, there was, a, there was a, a split in the duties, which was first of all, to, to prove or to test that this data set or this data source was, was workable with, and it was actually a viable raw material to work with. Yep. And then they discovered, and, it, and it's it's fascinating and wonderful that you saw those moments, those little serendipitous discoveries of these peaks shifting along. I guess a, a question just occurred to me there was, had you not seen those, would it still be interesting to see that actually language is quite flat, but that's not the point for this because it was not the case. However, I'm just thinking, Jen, from your point of view about the words used are, I guess there's two perspectives about word usage. There's who is the author of that word and kind of, so that that's the originator, but then is what is the topic on which they are using the word for? And so did you at every point feel the need that you might need to overlay the, the shapes and patterns that Moritz was surfacing with some context about, I don't know, the, the editors of the magazine at different points, the different eras of writing teams of authors to give it a bit more context. I know that these will come out in some of the little annotations, but to to kind of create a cause and effect overlay in some respects. Yeah, absolutely. And I've, um, for a lot of years, I've been kind of really interested in our archive. And so I've become familiar with the ebb and flow of editorial decisions and, and just how uh, the vision and the images and the words have shifted over time in the magazine. So I already knew there would be some crux points that I could already explain very easily. Um, uh, in part because the magazine kind of has a lovely tradition of speaking to its own history and its own pages. So its editorial pages are quite useful. <laughs> they go at great length to explain what they're doing. So uh, so this was, this, that, as a footnote, this whole project was kind of another gift to that series mm. of kind of, you know, um, uh, you know, for the next archivist, you know, you know. 200, 175 years from now, this is a little gift to them too. But, um, <laughs> but I knew that there would be uh, some major crux points and I knew that a lot of those were explained by change in vision, which often came with an editorial change. Right. Um, but then the point you're kind of remained, well, is this still a valid thing beyond just kind of folks who are super interested in Scientific American? But when you look at why those editorial shifts happened, it was in response to a changing kind of society, different ways in which science communication was being done, different audiences, expansion. Mm. You know, so, so a lot of the editorial vision changes are all, um, you know, are in response to bigger contextual changes. Mm. So it felt like as long as we could kind of capture that and provide some, a few touch points that, um, that the whole project would still be quite valid. Yeah. And that's the beauty also of how this, the, the page is laid out because on top here we have basically how many characters and in how many editions 
uh, are or like magazines are published per year and there you see the, the big breaks like the mm. structural breaks and there's annotations for that and below that then you have the fitting words so you have this sort of correspondence between what was the environment like that led right. to these trends. Um, I see, yeah. Give it a at bit least, more you know, you have a chance to establish that context. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and, and just just to kind of close off the point about the data, and, and it feels unsatisfactory to give it, a, you know, five, 10 minutes, but uh, Jen mentioned 5,107 uh, editions, uh, nearly 200,000 pages. 110 million plus words. I mean, this is <laughs> this is not a spreadsheet task, is it? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, my, I didn't have to turn on the heating this winter. <laughs> so my, my computer did all the, <laughs> provided all the, the heat. Yeah. No, I was impressed also that this is possible, like to handle with with like a desk, normal desktop computer without any like crazy right. you know, cloud computing things. Uh, so I used Jupyter Notebooks and Pandas. Pandas is a Python-based um, data processing library. And there's um, an open source framework called Spacey. And that's for natural language processing. And that does all the heavy lifting in terms of figuring out what are the words, what are the word mm. types, um, what needs to be discarded, and so on. And basically, I just ran through all these files and stored a lot of like all the word counts, basically. Mm into new files and then the next script would take these and sort of keep sort of filtering, refining, counting. Um, and some things had to run overnight, but <laughs> in principle, I was able to sort of, yeah, like crunch all that that, that huge data set, which, which was, yeah, it's interesting that we can do this now. Like I'm, I'm always amazed what can be done with like open source technology and web technology, and, right. which would have been unthinkable five years ago, right? And so. Good stuff. Uh, was there any point at which you felt there was any peril <laughs> in terms of the you mentioned about the kind of character recognition i mean could there have been a point at which you said look we can't do 175 years we have to do 100 <laughs> because the yeah. first 25 years are just too <laughs> impenetrable did that ever come up in the discussions or was it always <laughs> something that you felt was surmountable yeah, no, it was more the other way around. It's like the framework was clear. We need the, you know, we want to talk about the whole 175 years with that data set. And then it's more about figuring out, okay, what's feasible in that, you know, given that right. that brief. And yeah, a big part of like why we took just simple single words and made everything very simple and robust was because if you go crazy with such a huge and complicated messy data set, then you also need to do a lot of verification and you know, verification is anyways very hard because you don't have a ground truth really. Like if there's a funny spike in a word, I, I need to go basically to all the PDFs and figure out were there actually a lot of mm -hmm. articles about tomatoes or whatever, you know? <laughs> and and you can't do that for 4,000 words, right? And so it's actually kind of difficult to verify that what you're presenting there is actually, actually truthful, right? And, and um there might still be like problems, you know, like some words might should be in the graphic that are not there, but they were not recognized correctly. Uh, we, we had all kinds of issues with ligatures, like if the, mm. the typeface you use connects two letters like FI into one shape, which looks brilliant, but then might lead to problems <laughs> later when somebody wants to make a line chart with all this data, you know? And, and so that's something we discovered very late. I, I can't guarantee that there are no other like little data processing glitches left. Yeah. And we'll come on to the um, the, the 1978 tomato peak uh, in a short <laughs> while. So I think it's important to, <laughs> to talk about this. We found out why by the end. Well, the that's end. what we're at, right. We'll come to that. We'll save that as a, as a little Easter egg for later on. Um, so just kind of moving on to the contents then. I mean, the, the, the centerpiece work works are um, a stat area chart, stats bar chart, and a, and a line chart. And, and Mo, in your uh, process piece, you talked about some of the different um, options you were considering around sort of word clouds, um, animations even, spatial maps. I mean, was it fairly clear, fairly early on to you that you know these sets of charts that you did use would be the best ways to show the thing that you want to, to say? Well, in the beginning, we just produced a lot of charts and, and saw what they did, you know, and, mm -hmm. and tried to understand, okay, which combination could work. And 
it, like once it was clear we want to show individual word trends it was also clear okay we need something like yeah, like a little line chart or a little like i, I tried out all kinds of interesting alternative renderings like uh, like little spindles basically or yeah just playing with there's so much you can do of course with mm. trends over time but all of those the, and that was the funny thing they looked like they are tied to a certain time again like some things look more digital other things look more electrical others look more mechanic and i was like damn it has to work for 175 years so it, it has to be neutral in the technical metaphor basically right and so in the end the, the humble line chart was, was the, <laughs> the best workhorse for the whole thing and and the stacked area graph it was just so striking when we saw it you know so i just tried it out in tableau oh, hey what happens when we stack everything mm -hmm. and give it colors based on time it was like boom that's <laughs> it was, and it had this like this sort of marble quality or mm -hmm. this like 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 these layers of color and these subtle like changes in, in color and also this idea of sediments or like layers and then it there's feels quite like geological shift, you know yeah. and you feel like oh the whole vocabulary shifts because something mm -hmm. broke away you mm -hmm. know and this just seems such a good metaphor for let's look at the big picture shifts of the whole history of yeah. the vocabulary. And, and the beautiful thing about the stack diagram is everything is there, in there, you know, mm. all the words, all of the history of all the words and the whole tectonic, you know, movement. <laughs> and, and that's just overall really nice metaphor. But it was also clear, well, if you display a thousands of words in one graphic, you know, over 175 years, you can't label them all. So it, mm. it couldn't be the, the the bread and butter workhorse, but more the eye catcher and the opener yeah. and the, the let's say the, the artwork part of it yeah. maybe. And then we need something very simple and straightforward that can do all the, the actual like hard work of showing so many trends. Right? And this is how this combination came about, I think. And the rest again, arranged around that. I mean, one of the themes I'm sort of picking up here that it seems to me like a project that really does celebrate the importance of visual exploration, because the things that you've seen in the journey of exploring this data, you know, to a certain degree, end up being the same devices or the same core devices that you use then to show things to others. So there's a, there's a sort of nice efficiency and beauty about that. Um, Jen, from your point of view, you know, did you at any point feel a need to, to pro offer any steerage about the the style of the visuals because i'm wondering if from your point of view you've got any hesitation around using very complex unfamiliar methods for the audience that this will be for or to be honest did you just sort of see the process evolving and see the insights that the charts that moritz was pulling together and if you therefore saw things from that it was a good reliable indicator that the audience would also see things yeah, well, it was uh, it was really lovely because Morris was just kind of constantly passing along um, through base camp sketches and explorations. So I could kind of watch what was happening in real time without it being like, now we're having a formal meeting where I need to right. say yes or no. Or, yeah. So I could kind of watch what was unfolding and then we'd meet and kind of discuss. So I had a chance to kind of observe and digest and then we could have a conversation. Um, and, uh, and it was really clear that some of the explorations were quite abstract, like what ended up being the opener and a few others, um, and that that would be okay if we could offset it, as Maurice yeah. mentioned, with something that was very tangible. Mm -hmm. So um, just being able to watch the process and then come together occasionally to discuss and to both be on the same page with that balance between complexity and intrigue and nuts and bolts, what does this really mean? Um, was super important. And because we had eight pages to work with, I felt like we were given the space to sure. nod to both of those. That's right. Yeah. And the, and the big stats area chart does offer that hook. It, it's a visual device that kind of intrigues, it, it draws you in, and then you've got the, the perhaps more readable form through the, the small multiple line charts, which, they, you know, they're a line chart, but they're still styled in a way that's quite elegant and, and artistic. And... I just, just wondered the kind of iterations you went through more for those, because there's a little bit of, am I right in thinking there's a bit of kind of interpolation to sort of smooth the lines a little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and they're not, you know, they're not the default, again, sort of default Excel line <laughs> charts with grid lines and tick marks. And I think there's a certain sort of Spartan nature to them, which is which is beautiful and elegant. You know, kind of what, and I know that's probably consistent with your house style, the truth and beauty operator house style, but what kind of, evolution did those little line charts go through 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when it became clear, okay, the, it's gotta be line charts. So, and, and we had all these other explorations, but then we said, okay, let's do line charts. I was like, okay, if we do line charts, they better be damn good line charts. Because of course, <laughs> you know, I have a reputation to lose. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking, and that's an interesting challenge. Like how can you, given that very small space do the optimal like line charts. And also given that we present a lot of them, how, do you facilitate sort of also similarity comparison between mm. line charts that you can quickly see, oh, these two, even though they're across the page, have a similar mm. or opposite or whatever shape. And um, the way we achieve this is through, yeah, as you say, like both being really clever about how is this line exactly drawn, making it smooth, but still making sure that it hits all the exact years, mm -hmm. um, adding color to it. So left to right, like Jen had the brilliant idea of having like brownish and grayish colors for the old years and then moving towards yellow, orange, purple into the modern future, which is something I think that just works and which we haven't seen before, like to use this old to new, like really try and encode that really well. And I think it works beautifully and having little stripes for the years and really minimal takes. So we, we and Christian and I, we tweaked these line charts really for a long time because we knew they're going to play a big role and then yeah they better be good <laughs> and for the small multiple but also comparison. generally about the process i think what was really nice is that it was a lot of like ping pong it wasn't like it sounded a bit like jen was watching us working and had a chance to say something <laughs> you know but it was really so we had these basic ideas together and then we said oh we could roughly do a layout where and then we screenshot our interactive applications and like here these years and then these years there could be a timeline here then Jen would take that and make a proper like, mm. you know, mock-up composition. And then we knew, ah, okay, so we need this many columns here, otherwise it won't work. So we go back and sort of tweak the aspect ratios. Right. And also we gave the, the whole editorial team uh, early on like a, a quick search application where they could search for interesting trends, you know? And so they, so we all could together develop a sense of what are actually cool topics to juxtapose or what are cool topics to feature. And, right. and I think this was an exceptionally um, collaborative and yeah, very nice ping pong process in this front. So on that note, then the selection, what, what was the kind of criteria? What was the threshold for a, a shape? or a word being interesting. I'll come to you for this, Jen. Uh, you know, because there are obviously lots of, you know, editorial de decisions made here about both the uh, both the, the content, the small multiples, the words chosen there, but also then the, the juxtapose patterns, which are perhaps are slightly more obvious to pick because the patterns mm -hmm. dictate that in, in some respects. But what was the sort of the rationale that you went through for selecting those? Yeah, so the juxtapositions that you're speaking of are, uh, you know, two words, one, one line chart, flipped from the other so you can see their trends um, in, in over time together. Um, and and Moritz had actually tried some more complicated stream graphs with, with collections of words, um, but those were uh, almost too complex. And there was something mm. I think, mm. and we were talking earlier about how there's something kind of just poetic and charming about watching two words in, in combination. Um, so, uh, and these were to be um, created for the other articles and also to kind of create a, a bookend to this small multiples timeline. Um, and, uh, and as Maurice mentioned, he created a, a, a portal that we could explore, the editorial staff could explore the words on our own. So kind of come up with our own um, ideas on what words would be interesting. Um, and I don't think I told you this before, Maurice, but it kind of blew up our Slack channel for a little while. <laughs> People are like, oh, weather, climate, oh my gosh. You know, the, and my favorite was uncertain and certain. I'm literally certain. just looking at that now. Yeah, that was a yeah. wonderful juxtaposition that, yeah. Yeah, so people just started uh, typing in things. For a while, proper nouns were included. So we discovered that Gary, one of the text editors, did peak at a certain time. He's been ah, yes. for quite a long time. So I guess his byline uh, appeared. <laughs> but, um, so, uh, so there was a lot of exploration with the editorial staff. But then we also um, asked the authors for uh, uh, the different articles for words either in pairs or singly that they thought would be interesting for us to check out if they didn't, you know, they, they were allowed to use the tool for their own exploration mm -hmm. if they wanted to, or, or I would do some of that as well. Um, also, this was uh, before getting Lauren Dastin involved, um, I was trying to figure out how, how I could show her or provide some information 
so she could understand kind of what the project was about and how it related to her work. And so I sat down over the course of a weekend with her book, Objectivity, and just wrote <laughs> words, pages of just words and combinations of words that appeared quite often throughout right. that book to kind of, and then um, we created juxtapositions of those so we could show her the word trends um, of something that was already kind of a part of her, um, her, her, her work, her research. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it was, it was a lot of people involved in just kind of, you know, um, suggesting words either through serendipity and just searching or having a pretty clear editorial vision on, on why. I mean, yeah. could you automate that at all, Moritz, in terms of some kind of calculation to determine the pattern <laughs> strength or shape? Yeah, yeah. So uh, th it's a fun question because it sort of, so the, the thought process that, or the, also the code process that led there was, okay, single words, fine, but can't we talk about bigger picture trends? Mm. And we knew some really how the, the whole like perspective of the magazine has, has really changed dramatically. Um, over, over the decades, right? And and so we were thinking like, okay, maybe we can do these clusters of words that have similar shapes and and do an automated stream graph with that. Like you pick, let's say horse, uh, telephone and computer, and it would enrich the whole graph with anything that has like a similar trend to any of these, right? right. It, nice idea, super complicated. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. You know, it's one of these things you try out. But then, yeah, this sort of led us to this idea, okay, isn't it really charming to talk about something much simpler and just introduce two antagonists or two, mm -hmm. you know, partners or like just play with like this juxtaposition of two opposed trends. And these can in a parse prototo sense tell you much bigger picture th things if they are picked well. Mm. And so, so we use those basically to demonstrate what we know from the much more complex explorations but then break it down into really simple like almost cartoony form you know by having introducing like these two <laughs> artificial antagonists yeah. absolutely but the feature of comparing like, like saying this trend curve is similar to this other trend curve we liked it so much that we added it as like a the easter egg in the interactive so yes. if you tap a word you see the top six i think words with the similar most similar curve and then the flipped ones, like if you have something that peaks very late, we show also the ones that are very old in, in, in contrast. And that's just such a fun and, and serendipitous way to sort of slice right in the other direction the yes. that said, and introduce a bit more like random connections and, and, and fun like discoveries, but without being too like, let's say serious about it or, or trying to really characterize huge structures with it, yes. but more enable fun exploration. Yeah. yeah. And on that note of interactivity, the the other thing I suppose that would be a possibility, though I don't want to give you too much work, uh, given you've already done lots of work. Were you ever thinking about tracing back, I don't know, some access to the to the edition that these words peaked in to give you a another kind of loop back into the original? Was that ever a prospect? No, I. We may have flirted with that idea, but um, we had just kind of gone through that exercise for the cover project that Nicholas Rougeau worked on. Um, and it was, I, I could see how it'd be even maybe more complex in this situation. And I think we wanted, we didn't, you know, there's, there's plenty of ways to access the archives from that, um, from that interactive. And that felt like it might be trying to kind of clog it up almost a little yeah. too much because it's this little, you know, it's mobile friendly. Um, we wanted to keep it um, kind of a, a playful thing that mm. you wouldn't, you know, yes, if you want to see the archive, you're going to, we'll give you plenty of opportunities, <laughs> but uh, maybe not by clicking on this particular chart. Because the click mm. on the chart revealed already similar and dissimilar curves um, we might have been asking too much of it to try to that's do, right do two options two different interactive events to do two different things yeah and again it's a whole year that we're talking about like that's you know, right for the word and so it's yeah lots of magazine pages and <laughs> the funny thing is these words like language is funny so you know like the bulk of it is really the same old words over and over again and so if you have a specific word like insect or system, even if, if it's used a lot, that doesn't mean like mm. hundreds of times, you know, in an in in, in addition. It's more like dozens maximum mm. or tens. And so you have this really huge long tail of 
lots of really common words and then really, really many, many different, very rarely used words. And even the ones where you would think, oh, this is very typical like science language. It, it just doesn't appear that often. Mm. And then sort of, yeah, and that's why sometimes the connection between there is a peak here and then where does it come from and why is that really a lot or not? You know, that's, that's not even so straightforward. Um, to establish. Absolutely. And, and just going back to what Moritz touched on, Jen, about the colour scheme, which I think is, you know, it's beautiful, it's informative, it's the, you know, it's the quintessential perfect colour scheme. Where did that come from in your mind then? So you talked, Moritz talked about kind of the greys and the dark shades from the the old days. <laughs> and then we kind of go through this sort of yellow, orange, purple. Kind of where, what, did you see something that gave you that in, in kind of inspiration? Was it some quality from the from the covers, as you said, from Nicholas's project, what kind of surface yeah, that idea? For sure. I mean, uh, Maurice's earlier sketches had a much more kind of vibrant and equally balanced um, color palette. Um, and, and something just, you know, it was beautiful and you could really see all the trends, but just something didn't feel quite settled about it in terms of a, a, a look into the deep past mm. or our you know, the magazine's deep past. Um, but then Nicholas's um, color cover analysis it really, you know, it starts with these neutrals and then there's just a little bit of color that starts to pop in because covers, there might be, you know, every other, every other month, the cover would have a, like two colors. And then over time, they like start to ramp that up. So, so there's this neat kind of shift from mm -hmm. grayscale um, to a little bit of color to more. Um, so that, that definitely was kind and, of in the back of my mind. And in the like 1800s, it was all black and white, of course, mm -hmm. right? And so you know, there, there, there's not even meaningful color you could attach yeah. you know, to those <laughs> just based on, you know, how it was used. And so, yeah, so um, it, it totally makes sense. And, and also topic wise, there's so much like in the early years were so mechanistic, you know, there yeah. was steel and steam. valves mm. and steam, mm. and, you know, all this like really gray brown stuff. And mm. it just works. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's, it's a beautiful so, choice. It was a really good call. Yeah. yeah um the annotation i mean you spoke about the article that the kind of a, or the essay that kind of com accompanied the launch of the work and obviously lots of annotations in terms of the, the captioning uh, which again it helps us to navigate through the complexity of all, all the sheer amount of content to to process um actually with regards to annotations i was I want to go back to the kind of word choices and what were your favorites? What were your sort of favorite patterns? I mean, you've already mentioned, Jen, you kind of liked the certainty, uncertainty juxtaposition. What are the other kind of favorite patterns that you saw or more, most unexpected patterns perhaps? Well, uncertainty, uncertainty was my hands down favorite. Um, uh, do you have any favorites, Mo? I'm trying to think now of what my others were. Well, maybe now is a good point to talk about the tomato shape. <laughs> so for those who can't see this there's a peak there's in a huge spike in 1978 right the the year of the tomato so what happened what's the cause of this <laughs> well it's not as it, 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 you know there were lots of uh, speculation i think he posed the question on twitter he offered a beer <laughs> from the person who, uh, yes. who got the answer <laughs> <laughs> i never paid that beer by the way <laughs> well and folks thought well maybe it's uh, because the attack of the tomatoes you know the movie came out oh, all right tomatoes, and yeah. i was thinking oh genetic you know, uh, you know, tomato is often, you know, used for genetic um, GM, yeah. you know, GMO stuff. And, um, but it turned out to, uh, to be a cover story on tomatoes. Yeah. So the, and we just missed it when initially, like, looking for why the trade came out. Yeah. And so they <laughs> it used really it easy. quite a lot in that particular article. And that's one of the cases <laughs> where, um, you know, these, the, the line charts, um, the maximum usage is, they're all scaled to normalize to their maximum usage. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, peaks in that year but it's not like the only word used in the magazine that year to make it peak exactly. you know so yeah. so you know it, so it makes sense that one article could bump yes. a word that's not used a lot now the word sell for instance wouldn't get that big kind of huge gain so um so there was a little bit of a, a right you know this is normalized to maximize. Yeah. yeah and i suppose Mo, you got to make a call about whether to to show it relative or absolute, you know, so relative shape highlights oh, the absolutely. peak of tomato, yeah. but relative to other words, it's insignificant. So yeah. it's always attention in almost everywhere. But as we have seen in this top curve, the amount of text published varied wildly. Mm. And so, you know, if we had shown absolute counts, 
then you would always have had a bias in each chart. Yeah. Each single chart would have had a bias towards the more prolific, let's say, yeah. years just in word of uh, text. And so, yeah, it was important to normalize by percentage, let's say, of that word per year. But again, it's something you have to explain to people that might not be, you know, it's the, the best way, the correct way to do it, but it sort of complicates things. Absolutely. And, yeah, and but these decisions are really, really important, yeah. No, in terms of favorite words, I really enjoyed like looking at the adjectives. And I think a lot of the, the shift in the magazine can really be seen with, with all the adjectives, like how, how things are qualified, you know, and not just technically what is written about what the topics are, but actually how the tone has shifted. Mm. Uh, I found that really interesting. And, and the last 10, 20, 30 years are much more like, you can really see just in terms of the adjectives and adverbs used, how it's, everything's much more, differentiated, much less, let's say, assertive, but much more trying to express more nuance about, mm. you know, what, what we know and what we don't know mm. also. And, and that tracks with- Likewise, uh, anything human and, and personal related or subjective, you know, just came in, in in these last decades. And before, I think things were much more hard sciences, you know, <laughs> facts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here they are. <laughs> and, and this, you could really see in, in a bunch of like these, these work types yeah. and especially the not just the nouns and, and that was fun yeah that observation tracks also with the uh the exclamation points were quite early on and they were replaced mm -hmm. with question marks <laughs> so, um, that sort of assertive versus we're finding yeah. the answers you know yeah. kind of shift has uh, we found this uh, we think we have. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Excellent. So just to kind of close off with ref reflections, um, I mean, it sounds like you both, from your different perspectives, had fun. It was enjoyable. It was a good collaboration. Um, and the work that kind of comes out of this is, you know, is, is joyful. It's informative. It's fascinating. It's deep dive. It makes me want to stick around and look at it in detail. Uh, I think simply what... What feedback have you had from others? What are the anecdotes that you've really enjoyed receiving from people? Well, um, my colleagues loved it. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's complicated because, um, you know, we had high hopes for, for lots of traffic on the interactive as well. Um, and, you know, we were thinking that the summer of 2020 was going to be like a huge celebration of 175 years of Scientific American. <laughs> and everybody suddenly got interested in COVID instead. So, <laughs> so our kind of, um, yeah, so there were lots of distractions just in terms of like our own staff also now covering like kind of one of the most awesome. important stories of our time, but also readers wanting to know about that. And then us all like living with new challenges. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh Online, I mean, it it was a sol it had solid traffic um, for sure. It did break records, um, and it didn't have a terribly long tail. Um, but honestly, over the summer of twenty and twenty, almost all of our content was like we got a lot of um, traffic on all of our COVID related uh, mm -hmm. material. You know, that said, I think this this project kind of provided a fresh breath of air. Um, yeah, I'm hoping it did for other people too. Um, there was. There were some um, really kind of fun social media um, uh, interactions. Um, one of them was we asked folks to um, kind of take screenshots of their favorite little discoveries from the interactive and did a hashtag with Siam175 and science words as to the two hashtags. And so we got a lot, a lot of fun kind of upbeat and interesting um, yeah. interaction on that front for sure. And what are your reflections, Bar? Yeah, similar. I, I think it's, yeah, it was really a unique project and I really enjoyed like this close collaboration and, and having that that context, you know, that like having, if your client knows the, the material so well because it's about them, you know, that it's a curse and a blessing, of course, because you have to get it right. And, you know, there, there are sort of, there might be like hidden traps or constraints that you're not aware of. I mean, we didn't have it in this project, but it could happen. And, uh, but on the other hand, yeah, you have somebody who's really like really knowledgeable about the, the subject itself. And I, I always enjoy that um, uh, sort of working style a lot, if I can work with a really capable expert. <laughs> and, and I think the combination worked really well. It, it was still, although we really tried to keep things simple and elegant and minimal, you know, given this huge data set, 
it was still hard to pull together all these different pieces mm. with the the print, the different online version, then doing something specific for social media. So, and that's again and again, the learning, if you do something that really takes all these different channels, like serious, even sim simple stuff, <laughs> you know, needs a lot of different like assets and outputs mm. and tonalities and explanations. And, and, yeah, and also Jen put a lot of work into making sure that in all different contexts from websites, to e-reader, to printed version, you need to make sure mm. people understand the piece and you know that it works best given that context. And that's actually, um, yeah, surprisingly much work. <laughs> well, it is, but you can see that that's been put in because the whole collection of works is so ever so coherent. It, you know, it feels like it's a mm -hmm. whole rather than just all these disparate pieces that just happen to be about the same underlying topic. So I think that's great. Yeah, exactly. Well. And this is, we, we didn't want to do that, just throw out a few charts about the history. Mm. You know, we, we, of course, we took it much more serious, but then if you do take it serious, it is actually a lot of work to, to <laughs> assemble it in this. In this yeah. yeah, a lot of coordination. <laughs> you know, you want different hero images so people know that it's not the same thing they just saw, but it's a different aspect, but they still need to feel related. You know, an opener and the print issue, people know, you know, you, you know that they're reading all of this together online, they're hitting it at different times. Um, but also you nodded to this a bit, but there was a lot of back and forth at the end with, you know, content management systems. And when you're trying to post an interactive, you know, print is a one beast, uh, web is <laughs> much slipperier. <laughs> so uh, there were a lot, there was a lot of, of coordination at the end. And for that, I'm really grateful for everybody that was involved who stuck with it. Um, our web dev team to have a lot of projects going on. We're kind of troubleshooting mm. with Moritz and like, and we had people like, you know, test driving and, and, you know, doing quality assurance stuff. It just, um, it was a lot of coordination there at the end that, um, that yeah. managed to come together. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine. But that's a general challenge. If you do these like super interactive things that should also be tied to the text, you know, and live in these content management like platforms and, um, yeah, and at the same time, it should work on mobile and be super interactive. That's sort of intrinsic tension. <laughs> and again, the simple way would be big button, open a new microsite, and you're out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it sort of it seems it's much nicer if it's integrated yes. like that. Yeah, no. that's, a, that's, a, that's a cheat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but might also be the right call. Like, yeah. Know, but in this case, we again, we, we really wanted to, again, because it was about you know the publication itself. <laughs> would be weird that's right like send them elsewhere to the subdomain <laughs> yeah on github exactly. <laughs> fantastic well listen that's uh that's been really insightful really enlightening about this uh terrific project and we'll make sure that we share all the links to the the works from this collection the works that you re refer to as well elsewhere um thank you so much both of you for your time today thank you to all the listeners and viewers and we'll see you again soon on explore explain to see more information about today's episode, including some links to key sites and resources mentioned, please visit my website at visualizingdata.com. Here you'll also be able to find details about my book, information about my public and private training courses, as well as over a decade of blog posts. If you've enjoyed this series, please consider liking, subscribing and spreading the word. See you next time.